You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. And I have Adam Brown. He's the author of a book called uh, Bright Spots and Landmines. And uh, Adam, you know, according to his bio, he was diagnosed with diabetes in 2001. Uh, he serves as a senior editor and columnist at Dia Tribe and head of diabetes technology and digital health at Close Concerns. And he writes an acclaimed column for Dia Tribe. Uh, it's called Adam's Corner, which brings uh, actionable diabetes tips to over a million people since 2013, which is amazing. Uh, Adam writes and speaks extensively about diabetes and chronic disease, and uh, he's recognized as a leading expert in diabetes technology. So, Adam, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, tell me about um, you know what happened leading up to your diagnosis with diabetes, and was it type one or type two? You know, what what some of the circumstance around it? Yeah, so I was diagnosed with type one in 2001. I was 12 years old. Pretty textbook diagnosis: uh, losing weight thirsty all the time uh, and went to the doctor, checked my blood sugars crazy high off the charts and diagnosed with type one. And, you know, in 2001, the tools were not even close to as good as we have now. So I was on injections and finger sticks for about a year, got on a pump. And I think I was kind of a typical teenager in terms of coping with diabetes. Uh, you know, it's really hard to grasp the long-term nature, which is uh, of diabetes, you know, all, doing all this short-term sacrifice in terms of eating and taking care of yourself and figuring out the insulin injections for all, you know, for nothing to happen long-term, basically. And I, I think that's really mm. hard for a teenager to wrap your head around. And, you know, when you're only getting three or four finger stick data points a day, you're not really learning what is working and not working and what how to titrate insulin and insulin is just a really difficult drug to figure out the dosing and timing of. So I would say we did the best that we could, but as a family and as a person with diabetes, but I, I was by no means achieving optimal outcomes. And it wasn't really until I got to college that I had a, a few important turning points. One was one of my roommates was a bodybuilder and um, anyone who knows a bodybuilder or just people in general who are like obsessive about tracking and monitoring their health and, you know, building a plan and progressing, I, I picked up just a lot of important lessons from that. And so really just tried to start taking more care of myself, um, tried to start tracking things a little bit better. I also took some nutrition classes in college, which just really taught me that eating is among the most important tools you have in your toolbox to manage diabetes. Um, certainly in type one and in type two, it's probably the most important. And so it was funny because when I was diagnosed, I was told you can eat whatever you want as long as you take insulin for it, uh, which many people really? with type yeah. one are still told today. And uh, I think it's, it's actually some of the worst advice that is doled out because if you eat whatever you want and you're on insulin, it's just so difficult to match the insulin to what you eat. And so um, I began testing different diets in college and, and iterated my way to low carb b before low carb was really, uh, I mean, Richard Bernstein kind of pioneered a lot of low carb and diabetes stuff um, decades ago, but I had, I had never heard of low carb as a, a tool to manage diabetes. And so I, I just sort of iterated my way to that randomly. And, um, and then the last important turning point was uh, I took a summer internship at where I work now at Close Concerns and Diatribe and just began writing about and learning about diabetes for a summer. 
and I was at a conference in Keystone, Colorado, where there were a bunch of people with diabetes talking about this technology I'd never heard of called continuous glucose monitoring. And they were just so enthusiastic about it and so excited about how valuable it was that I called up, I went to the lobby after the session and I called up the company they were all talking about, which was Dexcom. And I ordered a continuous glucose monitor right there. And, uh, you know, at the time it was the Dexcom 7 Plus, but it was a sensor. You wore it on your body for seven days and every five minutes it gave you a real time glucose reading and a trend arrow. And back then you had to calibrate the Dexcom 7 Plus twice a day. You could wear it for, well, it was approved for seven days. People often wore them for longer. And uh, it was it was totally eye opening because now I could see instead of three or four finger stick data points a day, I could see in real time how my blood sugar responded to what I ate, exercise, and so I think the combo of all of those things really helped me turn diabetes around. And pretty much yeah. everything since is uh, I've worn CGM now for over sixty thousand hours, and so I've I've tested a. <laughs> probably 10,000 different foods and meals over time. And it just allows you an incredible level of learning and optimization that was just not possible before. And so my column and book, in, uh, which we can talk about, obviously, is uh, is based on all that experience. Yeah, I've, uh, you know, myself in my life were essentially like pre-diabetic. So I got, uh, I paid out of pocket for it, but I got CGM for me and her. And yeah, it's really been interesting because you can, um, you know, I've observed if you have a, uh, you know, a meal with lots of carbs and sugar, you know, your your sugar can go way high and then it crashes down way low. And yeah. you won't know what what's happening. You won't see that if you don't wear the CGM. You know, you'll just do maybe one finger stick two hours later and your blood sugar will actually look very low and you'll think, oh, it's low. What happened? What's wrong? You know, but if you wear a yeah. CGM, you can see, ooh, this kind of food spikes it way high and then it crashes down way low. And I feel terrible at both ends. You know, mm-hmm. and you realize so we, probably most people are walking around, you know, spiking and crashing three, four or five times a day, which is, I'm sure, horrible for your system. Yeah. And what, well, I think one of the most enraging parts of nutrition is a lot of it is either opinion or it's based on averages. And I think what CGM allows is very personalized nutrition because you can say, wow, when I eat X, my blood sugar goes crazy, as you were just saying. And you can kind of iterate your way to your own personalized diet that minimizes your glucose variability and minimizes your insulin. And uh, yeah, I think it's an extraordinarily powerful tool. What's interesting about CGM is, even though I've been wearing it for 10 years, it's still only used by about 30% of people with type 1. It's probably used by less than 5% of people with type 2, and it's probably 0% of people with prediabetes. So it just, it just, it's a reminder in healthcare how long it takes stuff to diffuse. And, uh, but it is, it is incredibly powerful, I think, for even for, as you were just saying, people without diabetes. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you know, if we go to a restaurant and we eat, uh, I don't know, you know, chicken with something at one restaurant, you know, our blood sugar won't go up. And then we go to another restaurant, we may eat what looks like the same thing, but your sugar goes up quite a bit. So I know this restaurant is probably putting in in their sauce, they've probably got a lot of uh, sugar in it or, you know, um, so you can tell that kind of stuff. Um, Yeah. I've also noticed if you have, um, you know, let's say a a poor, a bad meal early on in the day, it kind of aggravates, I don't know what's going on, but it kind of aggravates, I guess, my insulin response and my wife's because Mm. subsequent meals that normally wouldn't trigger an insulin response do more so. You know, I've seen, um, yeah, I've seen, you know, when, you know, when I'm sleeping at some point in the morning, you know, I guess probably because my cortisol is going up, the the blood sugar goes up, you know, so I've seen the dawn effect. I've seen a lot of stuff. A lot of it I don't understand, but I've seen a lot of things by using it. You know, I don't know if you have any more insights into any of the particulars like this. Yeah, well, what's really interesting about diabetes is so many things are interconnected and, People are often told, you know, just take your medication, eat healthy, exercise, and your blood sugars will be on target. And when you wear CGN, you realize that things like stress and sleep, for instance, have an enormous impact on people with diabetes. And so there was one time, I show this slide at conferences a lot, but 
you know, a, a night of four hours of sleep, had to wake up early for a phone call. I was really nervous about the phone call. And it was like 4 a.m. Pacific time. And my blood sugar spiked 100 points just from lack of sleep and stress, mm -hmm. not even any food. And oh. um, you don't really realize this when you're not on CGM. And, uh, and then you start to see how things really interconnect because if you wake up in the morning tired and stressed, and then you're kind of ramping caffeine to get through the day, then it's going to be harder to fall asleep at night. And you're going to be, uh, you know, you're going to get less sleep at night. And then you wake up the, the next morning sleep deprived. And then sleep has a huge impact on your ability to manage stress. And so, you know, you can just see how, how things just start to spiral. Uh, when you're tired, of course, you don't want to exercise as much. And of course, we know exercise is great for stress. And, and so, yeah, I think a lot about how all this stuff interconnects, and I uh, CGM is a really good way to figure out what your patterns are and what triggers you. And I've actually, in all this time wearing CGM, I, I started to catalog all the different factors that affected blood sugar that I just, you know, as part of my job, too, I'm going to a lot of diabetes conferences and writing about diabetes and learning from experts. And so between my own experience and learning from all my job and hearing from readers, I published an article, I don't know, maybe in 2014 or so called 22 Factors That Affect Blood Sugar. And 22 seemed like a lot at the time because most of the time people would just say like, oh, it's medication, food, and exercise. And so I had 22 there. And then last year I updated it and now it's 42 different factors that affect blood sugar by my count. And oh. that is a, just a ridiculous number of variables at baseline, but then you realize, A, you can't measure all of the variables. So there's not really a good way to say measure stress in the moment or to measure, um, you know, if my insulin infusion site is working properly. So that's crazy in and of itself. But then all 42 variables interact in super complicated ways, as I was just saying. So you never really know, at least with type 1 diabetes, like what is kind of in play at any given time. And so yeah, the madness of living with this disease is it's you're just trying to keep the car on the road, you know, your blood sugar in range. And, you know, you have access to a steering wheel, but the steering wheel has lag time and there's other things that will try to throw your car off the road. And so I, I think of CGM as this like awesome, it's like the clear windshield of, on the front of the car, or the GPS. It, it sort of helps me figure out where I am and where I'm going. And, and I just, you're just always trying to steer back onto the road and keep your blood sugar and range. So, you know, what are some of these uh, 40 some odd variables that, you know, are really surprising to people when they hear them or really informative? Can you go through a few? Yeah. Um, I think the one, one that surprises people a lot and that I've been thinking a lot about is just how much, how important sleep is for glucose metabolism. And so, uh, Matt, Matt, I read Matthew Walker's book, Why We Sleep, maybe six months ago. And I, I had, I, I mean, I had observed how important sleep was for my blood sugars probably four years ago, five years ago, but I didn't realize how vital it is just for glucose metabolism. And so he cites a study in his book, and there's a ton of research on sleep and diabetes. If you take a group of people and you sleep deprive them, say four or five hours a night, within a week, they will look like they have prediabetes, even if you haven't changed anything else. And Sleep, sleep affects both your uh, sensitivity or resistance to insulin, but also how much insulin is secreted. And so it actually affects both sides, you know, in someone with prediabetes or type 2, like kind of both sides of the glucose metabolism equation. Um, so I think, I think sleep really surprises a lot of people. And there's, there's a whole chapter in my book about sleep. And I'm, I'm working on a new book. And I think sleep is way more important than even I appreciated three or four years ago. Um, some of the other ones, caffeine can increase blood sugar, you know, so I, I find this is especially true with type 1 diabetes. If you're um, sleep deprived and stressed and then you stack caffeine on top of it, you get just a, I, at least I do, I get a really big increase in blood sugar. And, you know, if you don't have diabetes, I, I think caffeine is, is probably not as significant, but caffeine surprises people, I think. Um I, I have separate factors for carbohydrate quantity, carbohydrate type, fat, and protein. All of those impact blood sugar a little bit differently. 
And so obviously the more carbs you eat at one time, the, the higher the glucose spike, generally speaking, the type of carbs also matter. So, you know, 60 grams of carbs in orange juice format versus, and, you know, six, 60 grams of carbs in a pure fruit, totally different blood glucose spike. You know, the more, the more liquid, oh, the more you, sugar. So when you say totally different, what's, what's the direct comparison? Like if you had apple juice versus an apple and what were the number of differences? Or aren't. I haven't tested that specifically, so I don't I don't know how significant the difference is. But um, generally speaking, like if it's in liquid form and if it's liquid sugar, like it's going to be a rocket ship. And and generally anything with a little bit of fiber in it or in just just requ- in its more whole form is a slower spike. I don't know. There is some research suggesting that um, you and I might have totally different glucose responses to the same food. Uh, and so that that's actually another factor, which is just the personal microbiome. And so this guy, Aaron Segal, has done some interesting research with CGM and microbiome, giving people stand, you know a list of standardized foods, measuring their CGM responses, and then he's found pretty strong correlations with different microbiome profiles. So this going back to this notion of personalized nutrition, um, it might be that if you have 30 grams of orange juice and I have 30 grams of orange juice and then you have 30 grams of an orange and I do, we we might have different glucose responses to those exact same foods. Um, So yeah, I don't have a great answer to your question in part because it it might depend on the individual. But again, coming back to why CGM is such a neat tool is you can kind of start to measure this stuff for yourself. And then when, when you talk about spikes or roller coaster or up and down or big movements, what is big, what is not big? Like, for instance, you know, if I'm a normal person and I don't yeah. have prediabetes or diabetes and I eat a meal, where should my blood start? Where should my blood sugar start? What range and what should it go to? And I'll know, okay, yeah. not bad versus bad. And I can give yeah. you some numbers. I've seen them up to you. Yeah, so for the most part, someone without diabetes is going to stay in the range of 70 to 140. And you might spike to, you know, 130, 140 after a meal. But... uh you know, if you're if you're getting well above 140 consistently and staying there, that's that's really that's pretty high. Um, someone with a functioning pancreas, so I mean, the pancreas works really well and, until it doesn't. <laughs> but um, typically, someone without diabetes is going to stay in that range and hover around 100 throughout the day. So there was actually this was actually tested for um, with a modern CGM, the Dexcom G6. There was a presentation at a conference in Europe last fall. And, uh, yeah, people, I'm just pulling up the data, you know, average glucose was 99, standard deviation 17, and time in the range of 70 to 140 milligrams per deciliter was 97%. So this was a group of people without diabetes. Um, so that's, you know, a 100-point swing, for instance, would be a pretty big up and down. And uh, 70 to 140 is, is the range that I try to stay in with uh, my diabetes as well, because uh, that's just where I feel the best. And um, but the the target actually for someone with diabetes is to stay within 70 to 180. And um, they're still debating what the target should be in terms of percent time in that range. But it's, it's probably going to be 70 percent is the goal for people. And you can see that's that's actually quite far from what someone without diabetes would experience. And part of that is because the tools for dosing insulin make it pretty challenging. And also if you eat whatever you want and then try to kind of match insulin to that, it's just very difficult to keep your blood sugar in range. Yeah. No dosing with insulin, I'm sure is very hard. It's like a car that uh, is very sensitive to oversteer it. You know, you, you're drifting to the left, you get insulin, you go way to the right. Now you're going to go way to the left, way to the right. And I'm sure, you know, unless your diet's really good, it's hard to control, even with insulin or especially with insulin for type 1s. Yeah, it is. The, the way, the, the craziest thing about insulin is if you inject or pump insulin and take a dose of insulin for a meal, there's actually quite a lag time in terms of injecting or infusing that insulin and then your blood sugar actually changing. And so you don't really see any impact for 20 or 30 minutes and you don't see a peak effect until about 60 to 90 minutes and it doesn't finish working for about three to four hours. So imagine again, the car analogy, you know, turning the steering wheel, nothing happens for half an hour. 
most of the movement happens between 60 and 90 minutes after you steer, but it, there's still some steering going on three or four hours later. So that's why, for instance, eating low carb is really helpful because you're, you're just, the steering wheel turns are very, very small. And so even if you're making mistakes or it's, you know, you guess wrong in terms of how many carbs are in something, you're not going to like float really far off the road. So that's why that's, that's a really helpful tool. Um, another thing I've been doing a lot is time restricted eating lately. And so I've actually looked at 235 days of my own CGM data comparing what happens when I, when I eat my first meal at noon and then my last meal by 8 PM. So you know, this is also AKA 16, eight, uh, or some people call it intermittent fasting. And that, that, has been really, really effective for also keeping my glucose in range, you know, keeping the car on the road, because again, you're now I'm only turning the steering wheel with food between an eight hour window. And then there's 16 hours of the day where I'm just kind of on autopilot. And I find that my, I'm typically in range about 85 to 90% of the time when I do 16, eight, which is about, which is a couple hours per day more than I would just eating low carb, you know, throughout the day. So that might sound pretty small, but if you improve someone's time and range by two hours per day, that's actually one full month per year in range, which I think is kind of amazing because two hours per day in range is with someone with diabetes is that can come down to one decision, one meal, one food choice. And so I think it's actually pretty powerful to even get to that point. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something else I've been really digging into the literature on intermittent fasting and time restricted eating. And, um, the other thing that I really like about it is it just simplifies my life because I just have one less meal per day to worry about. And like most things, it's it's kind of hard to do when you start, but then it gets much, much, much easier over time. And I've, I found I've even, uh, lost some weight and I need less insulin on time restricted eating days. And so it's, it's sort of become a go-to, go-to tool in my box in terms of managing diabetes, uh, which is, which is nice because I, I think the goal for everyone is just to continually expand your toolbox. Yeah. One trick I found is that, um, and I think the reason why is that your, um, your muscle is very hungry for glucose if it needs it. So, you know, if I've, eating a meal that wasn't great and my sugar was going up, I go for a walk immediately, you know, for 20, yep. 30 minutes, and that'll bring it down, you know, 30, 40 points, sometimes more. That seems yep. to be a, you know, if you're in trouble, that seems to be like something you can do if your sugar's yep. going up and you're like, oh shit, oh shit, you know. Yeah, it, it is honestly, it's the first exercise tip in my book. And to be honest, it, if I could only pick one exercise to do, it would be walk after meals. Uh, it, it is so effective for bringing blood sugar down. Yeah, no doubt. The thing is not to use it as a, you know, as a way to not eat well and say, oh, yeah. I'll just walk it off. Totally. Yeah. 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 Well said. Um, and then back to the numbers of high and low. I mean, again, this is just my observations, but I've seen like, you know, for instance, like with my wife, if she eats a meal that, you know, got plenty of carbs in it, et cetera, her sugar can go to 180, 200, and then it'll crash down pretty quickly to like 60. And, wow. you know, she'll feel terrible when it's high and then she'll feel terrible when it's low and that prompts her to want to eat again. And when she's doing well and she doesn't do that, then, you know, so let's say start at 80, go to 110, and then it'll just slowly go back down to like, you know, 90 or 80. That's a, that's a good meal, you know, instead of the bad, you know, mm. crash burn type, type stuff. So I realized mm. that that probably what a lot of people are experiencing, um, you know, by eating poorly is that, uh, you know, they're spiking and crashing with every meal is my guess. And uh, the crashing prompts them to want to eat and makes them really hungry and cranky, you know, a few hours after they eat each meal. And if they were stable and we didn't go through that, they would probably be far better off. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I, I think, you know, one of the funny things about nutrition is it's it's so polarizing right now. And uh, the the funniest thing that I think is often missed is, you know, if, if you're on a low calorie diet, often that is also a low carb diet in terms of what the average person might eat. Um, if you're on, uh, or if you're on a, a healthy, you know, vegan or vegetarian diet, that's probably, if you're doing it right, it's, it's also a low sugar diet. And so I think what's, 
what's interesting about a lot of the evidence-based nutrition approaches is they do just reduce, it's about eating whole food, it's about reducing sugar, and, and both of those things are going to reduce what you just described, which is this massive spike that you get from refined grains and sugar, and then a crash, and then the desire to eat more. And so, um, yeah, I think I, th I think about that a lot, and I hope I hope the nutrition community and field starts to use CGM more because I think we'll see very big differences um, between people and between different diets and then between different foods. And again, it's all toward this goal of helping people personalize and figure out what what foods and meals work for them. Yeah, it seems like insurance, you know, doesn't want to pay for CGMs. They are expensive. Um, any experience in that realm, what they will pay for, won't pay for, do they want to wait until you're like three quarters dead in order to recommend anything? Yeah, great question. Well, I think the thing to remember is, uh, you know, CGM, I, I've been wearing it for 10 years, but for most people, this is still like a new technology and many people have never even heard of it. Um, but part of the challenge with insurance is you have to kind of show the evidence that it can save money or change people's behavior or help them lose weight or improve their cardiovascular risk. And those studies just haven't been done yet. And part of the reason is because there are so, there are so many people just with type 1 diabetes who aren't on CGM who, I mean, everyone with type 1 diabetes should be on CGM. Like it should be covered. It should be, it's an essential tool to, to manage insulin therapy. And so, you know, there's still a ton of focus on just like, how do we get CGM to people with type 1 diabetes? And then step two, how do we get CGM to people with type 2 diabetes on insulin? And then type 2 not on insulin and then pre-diabetes and then consumer CGM. And so one thing that's really awesome is companies like Dexcom and Abbott, who make, uh, Dexcom makes a G6, Abbott makes Freestyle Libre, you know, they're going to start to do these studies. Dexcom has several running. I think Abbott uh, is probably going to move in that direction too. Uh, you know, both companies have done studies in type 2 and insulin. There's studies now happening in people not on insulin and people in prediabetes. And alongside all of that evidence being gathered, the systems are also going to become cheaper. And so uh, Abbott's Freestyle Libre is the most affordable CGM uh, if you're paying out of pocket. It's, you know, some people debate whether it's a CGM because it doesn't send the data from the sensor to the phone or to the receiver continuously, but it does continuously collect your glucose information. And then you, you actually manually scan the sensor with a reader or with your app. And you get your real-time reading and trend arrow and your recent history. Um, but that, they have a version in Europe that, that sends, actually, it will ping the reader or app with alarms. Um, Dexcoms is a little bit different. It's more of a traditional CGM in the sense that it's continuously sending the information to the receiver or app, but it's also more expensive than the Libre. And so, but what's really great is Abbott, Abbott is... Um, you know, they're launching this continuous version that will that will alarm people. Uh, it's under FDA review right now. It's out in Europe. And then Dexcom, and so they're they're kind of trying to bring their features in terms of continuous data transmission up to Dexcom. And then Dexcom is working to make CGM much less expensive. And so they're working with Verily, which is a division of Google Alphabet, and they're making a fully disposable CGM that's smaller than the Libre, it'll be much less expensive, and that's going to supposedly going to be out next late next year. And so I think what's what's awesome about that is CGM is it's slowly going to become more affordable for people. You know, even if they're not covered by insurance, it it will be you'll just be able to try it for two weeks or four weeks, as as you were kind of saying with your wife, and that's going to be more affordable. And I hope what we'll eventually see is you won't need a prescription to get CGM. So that you can just go to the pharmacy and pick up a CGM and put it on and wear it for two weeks and and learn what you can and get data and um, I think that 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 feels inevitable to me only because you can do that with a glucose meter right now. Hey, you've been wearing one for you know the the, the G6 what we use you know for ten days in the sense. I mean even that tells you a tremendous amount. You know, even yeah. doing it once ever will give you totally. big insight, but it's good to have reminders periodically. Yeah, and it, it, you know a lot of what these companies are trying to figure out is what is the right cadence and serial. If you're going to serialize CGM, what's the right frequency of wearing it? And so you know you could imagine someone with type two diabetes, they take a finger stick in the morning and that's it. Versus 
you know, so that's 365 finger sticks per year. Imagine if instead we got we got rid of the finger sticks and we gave them CGM, you know, once every three months and figured out what, what can we learn from a 24-hour glucose profile over 10 days or 14 days, and we get that quarterly. And you can imagine the cost might not be that much more, but the learning would be 10x more. And so a lot of the studies of CGM and type 2 are, are going to try to figure out, you know, what's the right mix of how often you get CGM and then you get coaching and that sort of thing. So I, I think it's it's just going to become a more and more exciting field, which is terrific. Yeah, one finger stick in the morning tells you nothing. nothing. Tells you nothing yeah. about how you've eaten. I mean, maybe your you know, HbA1c kind of tells you, but uh, you know, you could have a finger stick in the morning and you know your fasting could be I don't know 105, and then you eat horribly all day and you have you know four or five spikes. And then maybe you just don't eat for a while before you sleep, and then your fasting goes back down at 105, but it missed everything that happened the whole day, all that stuff. So it doesn't seem to be very helpful at all. Yep, yep, totally agree. Yeah, I mean, with the CGM, you could also play this game. You could gamify eating, you know, oh, let's eat this, and, you know, I, I kept my sugar just at, at 100, you know, awesome, I won, versus spiking. You know, I mean, the whole thing can... Uh, yeah. The feedback it gives you is really great. You know, you can see when you're having something good and not having something good. And you, know, you may think, oh, I'm just having a little bit of this and that, but oh, it affected my sugar tremendously. All right, I can't do that. I'm not doing as well as I thought I was. You know, these are some of the examples. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. I, I think it, it's funny because C CGM started out as a way, as a glucose, a real-time glucose monitoring device. And what, what it's going to become is a behavior change tool that just happens, I mean, it happens to monitor glucose, but really... It's all about what you just said. Yeah, it's a good insight. What, what about yeah. um, a continuous insulin monitor? Is that a, a difficult you know, thing? And I don't see anything about it. There's some academic work on that front. I'm not sure if anyone's really close to anything in terms of commercialization. Um, one interesting thing is on their recent earnings call, Abbott talked about who makes the Freestyle Libre. They talked about using, Lib using the same platform, but for other analytes. And one of the things Abbott has, they also have blood ketone monitoring. So they, they actually, they're famous in diabetes for the freestyle brand of blood glucose test strips. And then they had the CGM called Navigator that wasn't commercially successful. But then they went back to the drawing board and made Libre, which is a continuous glucose monitor. And so my guess is, I mean, they could certainly do continuous ketone monitoring with that and maybe... Um, but I'm, I'm not sure about how far continuous insulin monitoring is, but, um, you know, one, one could think of continuous glucose monitoring as sort of a lagging measure of continuous insulin because, you know, if you, if you have a, a functioning pancreas and your blood sugar goes up, the, the area under the curve of glucose is sort of a, a measure of how much insulin is being secreted, uh, in a way, um, yeah, so I, I don't I don't know about that. I know I know a lot of people in the longevity community and uh, are interested in that, but I'm not sure where we're at with that in terms of certainly none of the CGM companies we follow are, are talking about continuous insulin monitoring being anything soon. Gotcha. And what's um what do you see being promulgated out there in terms of the wisdom and what to do if you have type one or type two? Do you think it's a lot of the, you know, what's being talked about by doctors and associations is the right thing or the wrong thing or counterproductive or re years behind what it should be. I mean, what's your, you know, you're in this community big time. So what do you mm. see out there? What will the average person experience? Good advice, bad advice? What do you think? Yeah, we live in an interesting time. Um, I think there's never been more good advice in the world, but there's also never been this much volume of advice. So it's easier to be continually confused about what to do uh, because there's just such a fire hose of knowledge out there. And so I, I think, you know, it's funny. I mean, my, my email address is in my book. And so when, when someone has a, a super positive experience or a super negative experience, I, I get an email about it from them. And it, it's, it's sort of a, a neat way to see just to be in touch with readers, but also to get their experiences. And, and many of the people who get it are newly diagnosed and, you know, tell me how useful it is to have, you know, food and mindset and exercise and sleep advice all in one place focused on diabetes. And I think, I think the medical establishment and 
certainly companies are just not, they're just not accustomed to that toolbox because it's, it's really a behavior change toolbox. Like how do you, so, you know, they're used to titrating insulin or adding this medication or checking A1C, but, you know, how do you help someone change how they eat so they keep their glucose in range? Or how do you help someone go to bed earlier? Or that's a, just a totally different skill set than what healthcare providers are accustomed to be, just because they're, they're not trained in it uh, or not trained enough in it. And so I think I, the other big problem just in, in diabetes is there are so many people with diabetes and there are so few healthcare providers to care for them. And there's about, there's 30 million Americans with diabetes. There's 84 million with prediabetes. And so, you know, there's probably 4,000 endocrinologists in the U S and then I'm actually not sure how many primary care providers there are, but you know, it's certainly not even close to enough to manage all these people with diabetes. And so a lot of times people are going online and trying to sort of piece things together. And, you know, like I said, very, very few people have access to CGM right now. So their ability to learn what works for them is, it's going to grow over time, but it's, it's not that high right now. And so, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of work to do in the diabetes field to to help people change their behavior and, and get to something that works for them and get them technology that can help them figure that out. And one of the neat trends, though, is there's a lot happening in coaching and connecting people with a coach and giving them kind of a basket of supplies that are automatically shipped to them, and then they can talk to their coach in an app. And I think, you know, there's some good stuff happening uh, one drop and my sugar and Lavongo and Amada and these these are all companies that are trying to give people a basket of connected devices and some programming and then a coach and a, or maybe a group of people that can help them Verda is another good example that's trying to do that with low carb and so I think that's a really good trend just because there's not enough healthcare providers to care for people with diabetes. And even if there was, they don't have enough time to help them with the day-to-day decision-making. And so having a coach remotely that can just give some advice and nudges will, would be would be really helpful. Well, at least diabetes is not, not increasing at all and, and everyone's safe <laughs> because uh, it's, I'm just kidding. Unfortunately, it's, uh, <laughs> it's vastly outpacing uh, any efforts right now, but uh, that's why it's even more important to do this stuff educate yeah. and help well very good what, what's the best way for um people to start engaging with you you know where should they get your book uh, where should they look at your column you know should they yeah. join the community what, what are some resources yeah awesome so uh diatribe.org is the easiest place you can sign up for our emails they come out once once a week maybe sometimes once every two weeks and we just share articles things of note uh, i write a column in there and so that's an, that's an easy way. Obviously, our whole archive is on the website at Diatribe. And so, you know, people can go on there and look at all of the columns that I've written. Uh, my column's Adam's Corner. And then the book is called Bright Spots and Landmines. It's actually available as a free PDF download. So that's just at diatribe.org slash brightspots. And that's an easy way to get it. it. It's also priced at cost on Amazon. So it's $6. And uh, I don't I don't make any money off of that. Norris Diatribe off the paperback. So that's an easy way to get it too. It's on Kindle. We have a free audiobook version too. So those are good cool. ways to, uh, yeah. And it's uh, just the right thing to do, you know, because there, there are so many people with diabetes and um, it's, you know, I, I still get a lot of emails from people who say, thank, thank you for making it free. Like, and uh, I think it's, you know, in the world of technology, sometimes it's easy to forget comments like that. So yeah, it's, yeah. Been, it's been really good. Well, Adam, thank you for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate your wisdom. Thank you for having me. It's a great conversation. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, 
or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.